morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the seventh installment in the 2021 Royal Tour Museum Speaker Series. Today, we're pleased to host Dr. Oksana Vinogora. Oksana was born and grew up in the Ukraine, where she did a Bachelor of Science degree in Aquatic Bioresources with an undergrad honors thesis on the evolutionary relationships of local species of shadfish. After graduation in 2011, she moved to the U.S., to Naperville, Illinois, where she attended North Central College and took an assortment of classes in genetics, virology, ecology, computer science, and so forth, to explore her research interests and options. By the end of her exploration year, she decided to continue her work on fish. She moved to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where at the University of Alberta, she did both a master's degree and then followed it up with a PhD degree, looking at evolutionary relationships among hoopiamorph fish, which are the very tasty herrings, sardines, anchovies, and so forth. After completing her graduate studies last summer, she returned to the U.S. for a postdoc project studying uh, diagnostic genomic markers in agriculture pests, specifically the Mexican fruit fly. In her free time, Oksana enjoys baking paleo-themed cakes, pies, and dreams of one day opening a paleo cafe. Today, Oksana will deliver a talk entitled Fossil Records and Evolution of the Modern Herring, an Evolutionary Success Story. I'm very excited about a fish talk today. In fact, so excited, I wore my power fish shirt. We see on one shoulder, I have the bullfin, Amy Acalva. And on the other shoulder, the northern pike, Esox Lucius. So, Oksana, you have the helm. Take it away. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction. Okay. So, thanks everyone for attending my talk today. Um, I'm very excited to talk about herring and fish in general. Um, that, that's been my line of research since my undergrad uh, because I grew up in, in a region where herring are especially uh, popular among people. Um, and so really this group of fish don't need much of an introduction. Uh, a lot of us know about herring and uh, what the fish are like. So, um, in case some of you are still looking for lunch ideas, uh, these are some of the products that a lot of us are familiar with and really like. Um, but coming from the ontological field of research, um, I know that a lot of the time, our understanding of a group, of any particular group, um, is biased by the present diversity that we see. So in case of Herring, and if we're being more formal, Clupiamorpha, which is a group that includes herrings and relative species, when people think about that, they think about all this, uh, all the common products like sardines, herring that they see in grocery stores, uh, and there is almost like this um, stereotype of a herring, the herring, right? So we usually think of this species, uh, which is when people have to describe it, this plain-looking herring fish. Well, that doesn't really represent the entire diversity of this group. It's, uh, it's a very diverse uh, um, group that includes about 500 living species and uh, over 150 fossil species. Uh, just to give you an idea and, give, and put the, this the herring, the stereotypical herring that people think about uh, into perspective, the same group also includes anchovies, also a very famous uh, favorite uh, group for many people, gastronomically speaking. Um, and 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 growlets or anchovies, they're also not all the same. We have uh, some of them are so-called red-tailed anchovies, like the uh, coelia. They have specialized skeleton of their uh, caudal skeleton tail. So is very different. We also have denticle herrings, very small, it's oh, very small fish up to five centimeters. Uh, very interesting morphology. We'll look at them a little bit later in this presentation. And my favorite of uh, wolf herrings, only two species in this group, but they are uh, quite amusing looking with uh, huge canine teeth, uh, predatory fish, 
beautiful, beautiful group and nothing like the stereotype of caring that we think of. Uh, in terms of fossil diversity, we also see many different shapes and forms. Uh, fossil clupia morphs tend to be um, more debodied. They tend to have uh, all sorts of uh, armor on their body. And again, we'll, uh, we'll look at that later. Uh, for a good reason, they're called double armor herrings because they have specialized uh, armor or modified scales along their ventral side, along their belly, and also along their dorsal side. So before the uh, dorsal fin, and in some cases even uh, behind the uh, dorsal fin. So all those um, different forms <clears throat> of, of herring. In terms of distribution, so this bias, this stereotypical thinking about a group also stems from um, also represented in our record how we see the group. So if we actually look at the current of the extant distribution of Clupiamorph species, so this uh, picture in the top left corner right here, we see that the highest diversity of species, up to 50 species in the region, 50, um, 60 species allocated in Indo-Pacific region. So in Indian Ocean and um, uh, between Indian and Pacific uh, region. In Atlantic, Northern Atlantic, along the coast, uh, coast of uh, North America and Europe, we see very low diversity of fish. But when we look at the actual record, so reported record of uh, fish appearance, of description, um, of appearance of fish, we see a slightly different picture. We see that, uh, so this picture, bottom right corner, we see that most of the appearance records, uh, descriptive work, come from the regions where we see lower diversity of species. So, um, and that is the historical, that is a historical bias mostly um, based on the fact that fish, those two species from Northern Atlantic and Northern Pacific regions, they're commercially exploited. Those are heavily uh, commercially exploited fish such as Pacific herring, Atlantic herring, um, several species of shad, and so on. So, our use of resources of extant species by also introduces this bias into how we see the group and how we understand the group. And it's very important because the way we see the group will also affect our interpretation of its evolutionary history. When we look at the fossil diversity, we also have um, in paleontology, of course, we have bias in terms of um, exploration bias or, or where the most of the exploratory effort is concentrated. So most of the clupia morphs um, and the fossil group are mechaiformis or double armored herrings. They also recovered from very few, relatively few regions in the world. Uh, and it's mostly concentrated in the Mediterranean region. That's where we have the highest diversity uh, of fossil species recovered. Uh, we have um, some of the earliest uh, species coming from Brazil. So, South America is not that well represented. It's mostly Brazil. Then uh, a lot of fossils are now coming. New species, very interesting species, are coming from Mexico right now because they're developing their program, their paleontological um, exploration in this region. So this is very promising. We have a few species from Canada. Um, so that, that's exciting. But again, we don't see very it's not evenly spread, so we know that there is some bias in our understanding of the fossil history as well. Um, so when I took up with the, took on this um, adventure of investigating evolutionary history of Clupia morpha, my main interest as a neontologist and fish biologist by my undergrad training was to understand how this modern herring diversity, so this group of uh, modern herring, also called Clupia formis, how it came about. So what, what's the evolutionary trajectory? What are the things that happen? And of course, there is a lot. And so this was just a summary tree. This is Hanford graded tree from my PhD work where I combine morphological and molecular data to construct this tree, including fossil species and living species of Clupia morphs. And there are a few things that I would like to point out and just discuss in this framework of talking about our path, evolutionary path to modern herring, right? So first, 
explain, there are three main points. Right? So the first thing is that origin of the group is estimated to be pretty, pretty old, um, at a pretty old age show for this group. Um, it falls um, uh, in a uh, Triassic, and the earliest divergent lineage um, within Gupia morpha herrings and relatives is identical herrings or uh, Princesapidae. Very interesting group, so we'll look at them a little bit closer. This group right now, what we know, only includes two species. One living species, Denticeps glutioides uh, from, uh, from Africa, and one fossil species um, from Eocene. So relatively young fossil, right? And we know this is the, uh, it shows up as the earliest divergent lineage. So we have a very long, very long um, ghost lineage leading to this place, which means that we're just missing a lot of fossils uh, up to this uh, up to this branch. They're very different from other group DMRs, and one of the uh, distinguishing features for this group, uh, for, for which they got their name, dentical herrings, is that their uh, dermal bones uh, uh, are covered with denticles which are in their anatomy. So right here uh, in this inset little uh, picture, you can see these denticles above this dashed line, they're inside the mouth. So these are functional, they're functioning as teeth and their morphology is just tooth-like. But then below this dashed line, that is outside of the mouth and these are the denticles that are covering uh, dermal bones uh, of, their, of their head. And in their morphology, they're just like, functional teeth. So this is very, <clears throat> very unusual feature for this group. They also show a lot of primitive features of their skull compared to this entire group. And what is more interesting for the entire Gluthia Morpha is that they're members of the group, but they have complete lateral line scale. And I know that usually it doesn't, uh, it wouldn't surprise you when you think about fish. Well, fish do have lateral line system. So when you look at a carp, at a perch, they all have lateral line system. It's a typical feature for fish. But for glutamors, it actually isn't a typical feature. Glutamors in general do not have lateral line along that trunk. Some of the fossil, early fossil uh, species, such as Santana glutia from Albion of Brazil, uh, it's a stem, it's early, uh, very early, more, representative of modern herring lineage. Uh, it also had showed a uh, complete lateral line system. But for most herring, that's not the case. As I mentioned, so for those of you who are not familiar with lateral line system, uh, in most fish, just like right here, we have the region relative of walleye that you find in North America. If you like fishing, um, you see this line, typical lateral line, represented by pores opening to the outside, and on the inside, it connects to, uh, to nerves, neural maps in that canal. And so any water displacement, any changes in water pressure, um, water current, it will be detected. It will, um, it will be detected by in-current water flow into this canal and will be detected by nerves. So it helps fish to pick up all of those changes around them and orient themselves. In PMR, so here is a typical Tenuolosa, um, big fish, just to show you that there is no lateral line scale. There is no uh, scale that just regular along the entire uh, body of the fish. So why is that? Um, and that happens, so it's not exclusive to PMR. In other groups of fish, there is also reduction. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not very common in fish, but it's not exclusive to PMR. Uh, that happens. So there is no um, definitive answer why that could happen, why that happened in Clutiamorphs. But some clues suggest that Clutiamorphs um, are known as um, very highly uh, fish that have very pronounced pooling behavior. They form pools at very high density. In fact, densities of those groups, at least modern um, uh, herring schools. They're among the largest aggregations of vertebrate animals on the planet. So those can um, can be composed of millions of fish in the same pool. 
they're also not just large in, in terms of number of individuals, but also density, how close fish are uh, to each other. And that uh, creates um, that creates situation uh, where fish don't need so this lateral alliance system um, becomes um, becomes more expensive developmentally to develop than it actually is useful um, for fish movement because everyone is so close to each other uh, that they can just move uh, very streamlined without this uh, lateral alliance system. The scrolling behavior is um, um, is very consistent in the group. We have fossil record that indicates that um, fossil members, such as here at the top, you can see Nydia, very famous uh, mass mortality slabs where fish show uh, direction in um, directionality, so pointing that uh, that could be a schooling behavior. Of course, there could be, they don't have to be schools, they can be uh, just aggregations of fish, but um, the fact that it's quite common to find a um, fossil record for at least some food PM work where a fish are pointing in the same direction. So there is some evidence that schooling behavior is um, in the fossil record. So this is something, this is a behavior that has uh, evolutionary history recorded uh, in, uh, in the fossil record. So this could be part of the uh, explanation. But don't think that they just. Uh, they are left out with no sensory system. In fact, they have um, food animals have very well developed sensory system uh, in their um, uh, in their cranium. So cranial sensory system is very complex. It has several branches: temporal, circumorbital, um, and they also they all connect in uh, modern food animals. Different sensory canals they converge into intracranial space, there is space inside their brain, oh, inside their uh, cranium, where different branches of the sensory canal, so it's very beautiful pattern, different for different groups of blue PMORs, if you study this. Uh, but different branches converge inside cranium, forming this internal um, 3D cavity that also fac uh, facilitates the hearing and um, sensory um, sensory abilities. As you can imagine, it's relatively straightforward to study in extant um, species this structure because it varies in number how many openings of sensory canals go into this intracranial space and so on. But in fossils, it becomes very difficult because a lot of uh, majority of lutea more fossils are uh, preserved in 2D. So there is very little three-dimensional resolution. It's very rare that we have three-dimensional lithium or fossils, but in some cases it does happen. And so uh, in recent work, uh, Hatha Bianco looked at the um, angrolid fossil where they were fortunate enough to discover this three-dimensional skull, CT scanned it and found this chamber, this uh, uh, intracranial chamber for the convergence of sensory canals. This feature, um, as complicated and as problematic as it, as it is to sport in fossil taxa, is used to separate two major groups of pupiamors that we looked at before, which are double armored herrings and modern herrings, pupiformis and elmictiiformis. Um, these two groups were estimated to diverge about 200, 199 million years ago. Um, and presence of this intracranial chamber um, for convergence of sensory canals in the cranial sensory system is used as one of the features uh, to distinguish between members of the two groups. So modern herrings are considered to be more derived and having this feature and double armored herrings are assumed to not have this feature or be um, not being at that stage of uh, evolutionary development to have this feature develop. But this, um, again, as I mentioned to you, it's quite problematic to say for sure for many fossils because of their preservation, because of the mode of preservation. So um, that 
that's why there are some supplementary characters that are used to differentiate between uh, tip groups. And in fact, when elemic tie forms or double, arm, double armor pairings uh, as a group uh, were established, one of the characteristics, one of the defining characteristics for the group was the presence of um, dorsal series of scutes or modified scales. And here you can see one of the iconic representatives of this group, the Promiscuitan Tatis from Eocene, Wyoming, Green River Formation. Uh, it was one of the um, standard members of the group. So when you think about double armored herring, uh, that would be um, almost like a stereotype for this, for this group of fish. And yet, in fact, they do have a, a series of dorsal scutes uh, running just from the behind um, of the occiput, so from the occiput to the insertion of the dorsal fin. Scutes have rectangular shape and uh, they change their shape over the, as fish grow. So in larger diplomistus, you see, um, you see scutes with uh, spines in the posterior, along the posterior margin. And in smaller fish, uh, scales have smooth margins. So there is some uh, diversity in morphology of those scutes um, for fish. So this feature was used to uh, separate double armored herrings to say that if they have this morphology of suits, they should should be placed in this order or in tie form. But uh, when the order was proposed, uh, there were very few um, pieces that uh, were attributed to that group. And as most of those um, were described, um, then it became clear that morphology of suits wasn't a really good character, that diagnostic character, to describe entire order. Um, here you can see, uh, again, another representative uh, of double armored herrings of Elemictis form is Elemictis status from Brazil, from early Cretaceous. And morphology of suits is very complex. Uh, there is spine on the, on the very last uh, uh, dorsal suit. The same morphology is seen in Elema Brunneri from um, uh, in Elima Brunneri that also has ornamented dorsal skews. So they all have different shape. They're not, um, uh, they're not the same shape or the same size along the series. And there's also posterior spine in the very last dorsal, peridorsal skews. Other diversity, so um, currently there are different types of skews recognized in this group, uh, including heart shaped or triangular shaped, uh, or in Sarbinistis, um, we have uh, rhomboid scales. They vary in their ornamentation, they vary in their size. So great, great diversity. So that character um, was dropped as a diagnostic character. But that's what double armored herrings for this element type for me. What do we have? For the modern herring. So, um, the question is how this character changed in the modern group that we see right now. And in fact, modern herrings don't really show uh, development, great development of a predorsal series of scoops. Uh, in fact, it's greatly reduced. And most modern herrings do not have a single scoot along their um, uh, dorsal margin. For the very few exceptions, and one of the exceptions is uh, uh, a growlet or a uh, member of the anchovy group, Cetitina uh, tenophilus. At the very back, so just in front of the insertions or insertion of the dorsal fin, you can see there is the single scute with the spine. So something very similar that we saw with Elemictis, but in Elemictis, it was a complete series of scutes with the spine at the end. In Cetitina, only a single skewed at the very far back with a spine. In other members of the modern herring group or Clupiformis, such as Tarangula, we have a single skewed, but preserved just behind the octopus, just behind the head right here, there will be a single shield-like skew sitting just behind the head. It's very difficult to see it in fresh fish. You, you have to wait for it to 
drawing, so it's not very obvious. In preserved specimens, so you can CT scan them. So both of these images on the right, um, CT scan images, uh, so it's a little more obvious to see this feature. And overall, in modern herring as a group, we see this pattern of reduced armor. So if we look at the double armored herrings, and here is an extreme example of Armitiformis cute development in Trypomistis. So Trypomistis got its name as a taxon for development of three series of cutes. So it has a regular abdominal series of cutes, pre-dorsal series of cutes, and post-dorsal series of cutes. So very heavily armored glutiamor. In modern herrings, what is typical to see is development of abdominal cutes. So we do see some degree of uh, it's different degree of abdominal skew development can be um, just a single skew just in front of the pelvic fin, or it can be a complete series as we see in this Alosa sort of horrendous. Dorsal series are rarely developed. So in Alosa, there is no skew along the dorsal margin. In some species, as we saw before, there are sometimes skews present, but very few. And so the question is, why why this reduction in skews occurred? Because we have this huge group of fossil glutia morphs that have that are very heavily armored, but then our present diversity of this group that we understand and we think of as glutia morphs as hairy, they don't have skews. So what happened? Why um why lose skews? And to answer this question, it can help to think about. So what is the function of the skew? So what, when can skews be helpful and um, what is uh, their purpose? And studies, in Kutemur, there hasn't been many, haven't been many studies on the functionality of skews, but there have been studies in other groups that show similar morphological developments of uh, abdominal skills of skews, uh, such as serosalmids and serosalmids are piranhas and um, and relative species. Um, so in this group, as you can see right here, very well developed abdominal skew of skews, right? In this group, um, study uh, conducted several years ago when researchers looked at um, morphology of this uh, of the skew and how often it gets damaged or uh, punctured or injured. So they try to assess whether this feature protects fish from attack from congenerics or other predatory fish that live in the same area. And they, in fact, they did find evidence to suggest they found a lot of damage, a lot of puncture marks, bite marks on the keel. They found lots of damages right, like right here. Lots of cutes along the belly were damaged. Uh, and they uh, concluded that yes, in fact, th this in this group, this is a defense feature. It protects fish from attacks of other um, aggressive fish. So that is that is one possibility. Uh, when you have lots of predators or other fish that that are attacking, that can protect you. Another hypothesis is that purpose of abdominal series of cutes is to hide from predators. So not so much protect, but use it as a concealment just to um, hide in the environment. And uh, support for this hypothesis is coming from studies. Um, there was one study in 1970, a very comprehensive study that looked at what body shape and what body features um, make fish less visible in the water. And so all those typical things like uh, counter shading, dark top, and uh, lighter ventral side of fish. So all those things were considered, but also they looked at fish with extremely laterally compressed bodies, such as hatchet fish, uh, that have they also have keel, sharp keel developed along the abdominal region right here. They also have um, photophores uh, that help. And so the purpose of this uh, of this structure in these fish 
is to make sure so here they modeled the shape of abdominal region, how it's very pointy and very uh, slender at the bottom, is that when um, fish is seen from below, then light that is reflected from the ventral margin of the fish creates less of a light disturbance around the fish. So that is the way if the belly margin is very sharp and it's very steep, is formed by the steel of tube, then light disturbance is minimalized and fish is less visible to the surrounding. So that's a way to hide yourself um, in the environment. So that's one thing. And then again, so the same study that looked into a defensive uh, a function of abdominal series of suits, they also looked at how this develop, how the degree of this abdominal heel uh, differs between fish that sleep in different environments uh, in terms of uh, hydrodynamics. And they found that Cirrostalmus that live in faster flowing environments, the more rheophilic fish, they have reduced development of abdominal heel. So here, these two series, they show heel from different angles, lateral, um, dorsal, and uh, ventral view. And they show that compared to, so here is your well developed heel in Cirrostalmid fish, you have anterior portion, you have posterior portion, so pre-pelvic, post-pelvic here is well developed. But in real helix uh, there are some that live in uh, rivers and fast flowing environments, anterior portion or pre-pelvic portion of the skill is less developed. It's, uh, it's reduced and in some uh, species it's absent. So they concluded that maybe it is an adaptation to re uh, reducing abdominal series of heel of the suit is adaptation for uh, fast flowing environments or real filic environments. And their justification for that was that, well, maybe uh, it is because in order to move in faster flowing environments, you need more, more space for muscle, attach, muscle attachment and uh, in general, um, yeah, so that was for um, for muscle attachment and this rigid heel does not create a proper um, enough space for that. So that was their justification. But at the same time, when they looked closer at the data, uh, they came up with alternative hypothesis. Well, in fact, fish that move to those fast flowing environments, they also experience less predat predatory or aggressive attacks predatory pressure or aggressive attacks from other fish. So maybe reduction in the skill development was simply consequence of relaxed constraint. There was no need to invest energy and resources into developing this uh, heavy body armor when really they don't need to be protected from predators and other aggressive fish in that, uh, in that environment. So maybe uh, it was Safe environment. And that goes well with the safe place hypothesis. Safe place hypothesis says that sometimes fish that sleep in one normal settings where they have, um, where they encounter lots of predators and competitors, they will move to a different uh, environment because it's safer. It provides uh, a safe place for the uh, phony, for their life, for or for different purposes in their life. So this explanation could go well with this. So maybe moving to rheophilic environments is a safe place for fish. And that's why they have reduced abdominal heel armor. And of course, textbook example with sticklebacks, right? So we all know that sticklebacks are incredibly plastic in terms of development of the plate armor. They don't have a keel, they don't have abdominal keel, but they do have lateral plates, they have spines that vary in how, how, how well they're developed along the body. Uh, there are forms that are completely armored, that they have complete lateral armor of plates along their body, uh, and, they're, and they're usually marine forms. So marine forms have 
heavy armor along their body, and they're freshwater fish that have fewer lateral scales. And some studies suggested that reducing number of plates in sticklebacks, uh, especially in freshwater sticklebacks, could be a way to adapt to um, freshwater environment in terms of buoyancy control. So reducing density of your body helps stay buoyant in a freshwater environment compared to saltwater environment in marine habitats. They tested that and uh, doing modeling, so they had fully plated form and they modeled removing uh, each individual plate how, and how that would affect buoyancy of the fish. And they found that, uh, in fact, yes, if they remove all the plates, so they um, approach this marker type of low plated uh, freshwater stickleback buoyancy, uh, gets close to what it should be in a uh, freshwater environment. Another alternative, another strategy for this would be to increase um, swim bladder volume. And that's what they also reported that in some stickleback and some places, they, um, freshwater forums just had larger volume of their swim bladder as a way to increase their buoyancy in freshwater environments. But that doesn't, this strategy doesn't work for all fish uh, because, let's say, in clupia morphs, uh, uh, increasing uh, swim bladder volume will decrease the volume of the body cavity. And when they're spawning, they're famous for uh, having their body cavity full of uh, gonads. Gonads are pretty much taking the entire uh, body cavity. And so they don't feed, they just go spawning, they die at the end, something very similar to uh, what uh, salmon does that's seen in food more. So really, they need to have as much of body cavity as they need. Increasing uh, swim, bladder, uh, to, uh, swim bladder volume is not a good strategy. So the better strategy for this group of fish for food more would be to reduce body armor. And so maybe that could be so Maybe if evolutionary, at some point in evolutionary history, glutiamorphs moved from saltwater environments into freshwater environments, that could be um, triggered for, um, for losing armor. Again, so all those different hypotheses. Uh, and now let's try and pull everything together and see um, if we can find a pattern and explain why we have this diversity that we see now that uh, is shaped the way it is. So let's see what happened when we saw the uh, diversification. So diversification of modern lineages of Lupia morphs happens uh, right after the KPG boundary. KPG boundary marks the uh, extinction of maturity from at least what we know right now, majority of double armored herrings, so heavy armored herrings, and diversification of uh, modern Lupia morphs. So what happens then? Well, one thing that we know for sure that happened is that a lot of predatory, lar large predatory um, Actinopterygian lineages go extinct. So um, fish such as Salmon Lake today, uh, it's adaptive for me, they uh, they go extinct, so that reduces predatory pressure on fish um, on lower um, at the lower level of uh, of feeding, such as blue peel morphs. That reduces pressure on them. So, and again, as we saw before, when there is lower predatory pressure, then there is less need for developing. A or investing energy into defensive strategies such as um, such as armor. So that could be one thing, but that definitely having less predators that promotes diversification. There is there is lots of niches opening up, so there was lots of space for clupiamorphs uh, to explore new habitats and try something, um, uh, try try new uh, ecological niches there. So that could be one of the promoters of diversification. Another thing is that uh, when um, another study looked at 
uh, habitat preferences in two tumors, they reconstructed to what was the um, most likely ancestral habitat in terms of salinity preference for the modern herring. So right here for uh, cupioids, they reconstructed as a marine habitat. So marine habitat salt waters uh, were most likely to be uh, preferred habitat, majority of from um, who live there. And as we got to this uh, KPG boundary, after that boundary, we see a lot of lineages that um, that are reconstructed having freshwater or the Eurihaline environment environment uh, preference. So fish that are able to live in freshwater, salt waters, more uh, plastic um, in their salinity preference. And that, again, so that indicates that uh, KPG boundary with all the environmental changes that happened, and obviously it was a great stress for uh, aquatic environments um, and ecosystems as well. So that could put um, school PMR to uh, move from marine habitats that were common from um, early on for this, for this group, move into uh, freshwater habitats. And if they did move into fresh water or bracket water, less saline, uh, less salty environments, again, we can think back and we know what usually happens with heavy armor fish when they move into uh, freshwater habitats, they start losing armor for different reasons uh, from what we discussed uh, before. So those two things go together quite well as a possible explanation of two patterns, reduce, reducing body armor and also exploring new habitats, exploring new uh, environmental niches. Uh, in fact, in some groups that we have now, um, including Pacific herring, Copaea falassi, we see this behavior. So this group of fish is mostly marine and oceanodromous. So also it's very close relative Atlantic herring, Copaea harangus. They're, they're marine fish. And for marine fish, the typical behavior, spawning behavior, is to release eggs for incubation in open water. So they just, uh, they don't lay their eggs on substrate or, or uh, don't attach their egg masses to substrate, typical open water fish. But for these um, species, what we see is that they do prefer laying eggs on the substrate. So seaweeds, uh, uh, rocks, and it, they they attach their eggs to a substrate. And this is a typical behavior for fish that live in rivers, that live in real silic environments. So because those fish, they can just release uh, uh, eggs and let eggs develop in water because they will be all washed down with the current, right? So they need to make sure that they stay attached uh, to a substrate. And this is behavior that is still present in some of the marine, now marine uh, clupium or uh, modern herring. As the evidence, it, it's been suggested that this could be evidence of their past freshwater uh, living, that they used to live, they used to be uh, freshwater, uh, in, uh, freshwater residents. Uh, and that's why they keep their behavior, they just, and this is not surprising. So for so glutamorphs, it seems like a very drastic change to go from marine environment into freshwater environment. But for glutamorphs, it might not be such an uh, unachievable task because if we, again, if we look back uh, at the evolutionary history of the group, at the fossil record, and where this fossil record comes from, then we'll see a few interesting things. Well, the earliest, and here is a map showing, uh, it's an Albion uh, map showing the oldest, uh, the earliest, uh, including some of the oldest fossils for group or as a group. So some of the oldest fossils uh, as of now are known from uh, Brazil, uh, from Bohemian age. Uh, so it will be about 100, 130 uh, million years ago. And from Spain, it's, it really, uh, and those those fossils are coming from what we would probably classify as brackish water environments. They're coming from um, estuarine environments, from lacustrine environments. So environments that it, there is definitely 
um, influence of fresh water. So that's, uh, that's a good indicator that already at that point in evolutionary history of this group, they were able to tolerate um, brackish water environments. And uh, after that, shortly after that, we have formed in uh, marine sediments, in freshwater sediments. So here is the part of the Chetungensis uh, uh, from uh, China, from a low Cretaceous. It's known from freshwater environment. Of course, interpreting salinity preference in fossil record is, is not a uh, very precise uh, practice. It's not, uh, it's not going to give you precise um, results. But it does tell us that this group in general is very tolerant in terms of salinity levels that they can, uh, they can live in. And it's still evident in modern herring that a lot of them are anadromous. They migrate from salt waters to fresh waters and vice versa. So salinity is not a great barrier for groupia morphs to overcome. They're quite capable of spreading across gradients of salinity quite well. So that's where we're at right now. Um, and all those things, they helped shaping uh, present diversity and abundance of groupia morphs that we see now. And we should really appreciate them because this fish that is not very, is not very flashy, very plain looking fish for most part, they, they're a huge part of the ecosystems. Uh, they're a huge part of ecosystems in terms of uh, feeding aquatic mammals, feeding other uh, predatory fish, feeding humans, of course, because they contribute almost a quarter, sometimes in some years, over a quarter of global fisheries production. And their role, so they're also they're associated with reef ecosystems. So they're not considered to be reef fish per se because they migrate between oceans and reef systems and they bring, they create this connection of nutrients between open ocean waters that are rich in nutrients. And once they migrate there, they feed there, they come back to reef systems and other fish can feed on them. So they create this nice interconnection of uh, nutrients between systems. And so their role right now being very important forage fish, being important part of the ecosystem, uh, it was probably as, as important uh, millions of years ago. So in late Cretaceous, instead of forages, you could have uh, mosasaurs feeding on them. So this fish should really be appreciated for their incredible role in what their part in ecosystems are. And of course, there's still a lot of questions remain about the evolutionary history. And to me, the most interesting questions are, where are the fossils that we're missing? Because we're missing so much. Uh, as I mentioned, right now, the earliest record that we have for this group is from Bremian, right? And estimated origin of the group is much older than that. So we're clearly missing a lot of very important uh, fossil record for the group. So this would provide us with, um, with very valuable information. So just increasing uh, exploratory effort. Um, and for this, I would like to thank um, everyone who provided material. I would like to thank, because it, it was a, a part of my uh, PhD research, so I would like to thank um, University of Alberta, uh, Laboratory for Vertebrate Paleontology, my uh, PhD supervisor, Dr. Alison Murray, um, who supervised this research, yeah, and everyone who, so many people to thank, uh, and of course, uh, thank you for attending the talk today. Um, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. That was, uh, that was interesting. And we have a few questions, and I'm just going to let people know that Oksana has another commitment uh, shortly after the noon hour, so we're going to have to keep the, the question and answer session short. So uh, Sarah has been quite interested in your talk. She also enjoys some kippers during the talk, she says. 
Uh, two questions from Sarah. One is in the, uh, the micro CT scan of the uh, skull you showed early in your talk, uh, what was the approximate age and where was that uh, specimen from? Yeah, so that um, that was from Eocene, so um, uh, that would be about 50 million years rough um, in age. Um, right. can't, I can't remember precisely right now. There is a more precise age for that uh, in the paper. And uh, uh, yes, that was um, uh, from from Italy, but I don't remember exact locality. So yeah. And our other question, and this is this is interesting. You showed some uh, examples of injured feet on and, and abdominal bones on some other fish. At, do those reheal? Do those grow back, or do they keep those injuries through their life? So abdominal fluids, uh, they don't they don't regrow them. Injuries they sustain injuries, so they, they keep them throughout their life. And uh, yes, unfortunately, heal is not is not repaired. So that fair enough. So I'm going to ask because that naturally leads to this question: Is there any Evidence of that in the fossil record, where you see damage on uh, on the scutes, on on your armored herrings. Uh, it's a great question. So um, it's very difficult to interpret. I will uh, I will be honest. I did not assess that during my program, but it quite often it's just very difficult to. It would be very difficult to interpret whether it's damage or whether it's just uh, preservation um, of the fossil. So. I'm yeah, it will be, but it will be definitely very interesting <laughs> uh, question. Yeah. Fair enough. Sometimes we see those fun fossils and go, wow, that's really cool. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, when, when we think about bite marks, then yes, and uh, on bones and larger bones, it would be uh, easy. So I know with the uh, reptiles, uh, dinosaurs, it's easy, but with cute, I'm just thinking about uh, because of the mode of preservation, it's very two-dimensional. Um, it will be a very challenging task, but definitely very interesting as well. Uh, Mark Wilson has joined us virtually, and he asks, what do you think about the possibility that the Clupomorpha are not a Triassic age, but actually first diversified in the mid to late Jurassic? And what is the evidence for the, uh, the Triassic origin idea? Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Mark. Very good question. Um, yes, so as with any kind of uh, divergence time estimation analysis, it's it's an estimate, right? And there is uh, obviously an error bar that goes along with that value of Triassic age. Um, and to be honest, uh, I do think that Triassic is, it is an old age. That's why it just seems um, not suspicious, but it seems like we're just, if that's the case, then we're missing so, so much. Um, I um, I know there are some fossils that have been attributed to uh, Clupia morpha from Jurassic, um, whether or not they actually um, belong to this group is, is another question. But um, yes, I, I do feel like Jurassic is, it is an old age, but uh, at the same time, we don't, that's the thing, we don't know. We're still, we're missing a lot of the information. Um, what is the evidence for Triassic origin? What is the evidence? Uh, it's just the analysis, the time uh, calibrated analysis. And I completely understand that it is, it is an estimate. It's um, just sampling from prior distributions. I, uh, I admit that it is a sampling procedure and there is an error bar that goes with it. So, um, not unusual to have these really old ages that we all look at and kind of haunt, wonder how good they are until someone actually finds a fossil of that age. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, Koei asked, do you ever find isolated scutes and are those diagnostic within the double armored herrings? Um, isolated scutes? Yes, they uh, usually there is. Also, with the scutes can uh, can be um, dissociated from the fossil. Uh, how diagnostic are they? Uh, dip diplomistic scutes, they're quite 
extra distinct in their morphology, especially those later stages from larger fish that have the serious spines to so those sub rectangular uh, shapes. So I would say that uh, from a uh, double armor herring site is quite diagnostic for diplomacy. So I would say, Corey, to answer your question, yes, there is definitely diagnostic um, power in uh, squid morphology for double armor herring. But even abdominal skews, so when you look at uh, modern clupia morphs, there is um, diversity uh, that can be assigned to specific groups uh, within clupia morpha. Um, so I know that Sardinops uh, has a slight uh, expansion, posterior expansion of the abdominal skew. So yes, uh, skews uh, do have diagnostic power. Yep. Yeah, and I'm pleased that uh, Zarina Johansson has also joined us from London. And Zarina asks, you touched on the teeth, but has the dentition changed through the evolution of group and were changes in the environments that were inhabited? And she also says a very nice presentation. Thank you, Zarina. Um, so dentition in Kupiamors uh, evolved in a way, a lot of Kupiamors that we have right now, the extant diversity of Kupiamors, they, um, they're either filter feeders uh, or have very reduced intuition. So I would say that, uh, but at the same time in the fossil record, we also see a lot of uh, Kupiamors that don't have very um, well-developed dentition. Uh, dip, uh, diplomistas, they do have uh, well-developed dentition. So has it changed? Um, I would say it's been diverse through the, uh, in 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 the group throughout the history, so it's just been um, representing diverse niches that uh, this group occupied. And um, I would say that in general, dentition in Clupia morphs is a relatively plastic feature because in many groups um, it changes through ontogeny. In some groups, uh, they will let's say in Alosa, Alosa day I. I'm more familiar with this group. Uh, they um, they can have teeth in later stages of their development, so it changes with the uh, feeding niche that they occupy. So when they're still growing, they might be feeding on plankton more, so plankton will be taking up more of their diet. But then fish uh, that grow in environment where there is more competition for food resources, they may develop teeth, whereas or the same members of the same species that live in an environment with plentiful uh, plankton um, resources, they may not develop teeth. So uh, I would say dentition in Kupia morphs uh, overall um, is relatively uh, plastic in this way, except for, of course, like several groups where we have this um, canine form, uh, very sharp uh, fang-like dentition as wolf herrings and so on. There it's quite fixed and it's uh, diagnostic. So Sinoclupia is another example where they're, um, uh, it's, it's diagnostic that they have uh, fang-like teeth uh, in their mouth. So I would say to um, the degree, it's, it's diverse inside the group, uh, but um, in majority of the group, it's, uh, it's plastic for fish that can feed on uh, phytoplankton. So, um, yes, sorry. Great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, my colleague Jeff across the hallway is interested in, if you could talk a little bit about after the, the uh, KPG extinction, when some of those major predatory groups of fishes uh, drop out of the record, but obviously there are are other groups of predatory fishes that came into their own during that time. So which one of those would be ones that uh, Clupia morphs would, would really have to deal with? And is, the, is that schooling behavior, is that something that's related to, to that? Yes, definitely. Schooling behavior is in many other fish. Uh, it is a, a way to protect, um, protect species uh, or from predatory pressures, uh, right? Because or fish when they um, when they're in group, it increases their chances of surviving that path. And um, I would say uh, so predators that uh, came in place. So um, 
first and foremost, so lots of uh, perch like fishes that were predatory, they would they would become uh, more of a um, more of a danger for uh, groupia more uh, after the KPG boundary. Um, so definitely they're predators, but also because groupia morphs are broadly speaking forage fish, not just for other fish, but also for birds and for aquatic mammals. So they just they put base for so many organisms. So um, yeah, schooling behavior definitely helps uh, to avoid those predators. Everyone loves fish. Yeah. Well, almost. All right. Uh, Femka, our postdoc, asks, uh, we're working, she's working on a macroevolutionary project looking at mosasaurs versus uh, large fish, where at the end of the Cretaceous, the big fish disappear and mosasaurs uh, take over the niche. Okay, I'm a little confused. Anyway, would you say small fish manage to stay? Out of extinction by virtue of their small body size and aggregation. So after the at the KT, herrings don't seem to be too impacted by that. The KT. Uh, yes, it would definitely be easier for small body fish to um, survive from uh, mass mass extinction event simply because they don't need as much um, food resources. They're more plastic, and uh, it's easier for them to sustain their um, they're living than for larger uh, body fish. But then after um, KPG boundaries, so uh, the 3D cell that I showed that um, that belongs to one of those predatory anchovies, so one of those forms that, that was found, uh, that fish was pretty uh, considerable in size. I think the estimated size for that fish was up to one meter. So, uh, but that was way, way past that. So, uh, Groupia morphs, yeah, so the getting past the KPG boundary was definitely easier when um, when it was smaller body fish, but after that, they did diversify, they did explore the different ecological niches. They, there was some ex evolutionary experimenting with uh, um, behavior in terms of feeding, because now we don't really think of anchovies as predatory fish, right? Uh, but then in the fossil record, we do find those uh, rare examples. So definitely there was a lot of uh, evolutionary exploration that was happening. All right. I know you're, you're pressed for time. We have one last quick question for you. Uh, Sarah asked, how far inland are uh, Clupiamorus found? Yes. Oh, um, Clupiamorus, uh, there are some species that um, inhabit land landlocked um, Lakes. So again, uh, in in sheds, so there are some landlocked uh, populations exist, freshwater uh, populations in Greece. So inland uh, Europe, quite common in North America as well. So what what happens quite often with groupia morphs, especially ones that uh, anadromous, the ones that migrate between marine waters and fresh waters for spawning or for feeding, evolutionary. Um, happens sometimes is that some populations would migrate up the stream and they would go into tributaries, uh, sometimes quite up high. I can't, I can't name the exact number, so, uh, but uh, definitely tens of kilometers uh, in, inland uh, upstream. And in some cases, they just remain. They become resident forms. They become um, resident populations. In some cases, those populations become landlocked and they uh, then evolve in isolation because connections connections to uh, the stream become uh, broken, so there is no more connection to the mainstream and then to the sea or ocean, and they uh, become isolated and just evolve from in isolation and develop into evolve into new species eventually. Oh, great! Yeah, I always think of them as ocean fish. Yeah. Cool, cool to know there are some inland ones. Yeah. All right. Well, that uh, that's all our time we have for today. Oksana, I'd like to really thank you for an interesting talk on something other than dinosaurs or saber-toothed cats. It was great. And good luck with your uh, Mexican fruit fly work. Yeah. And we thank hope to so see much. you back, back in Canada at some point. Thank you. And 
Our talk next week is a uh, regular in the speaker series, John Noen from Calgary, who will be giving a more general talk on extraordinary modes of preservation in the fossil record. So I urge you to uh, attend that as our first talk of the spring. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. You get out and enjoy that glorious early spring-like weather. Thanks. Bye.